Good afternoon. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, the Australian High Commission, uh, the His uh, Your Excellency, uh, the Ambassador, Deputy uh, High Commissioner, and the staff for uh, arranging uh, and helping us to uh, organize uh, uh, this uh, public lecture by Professor Garrett Banks. We are indeed uh, uh, privileged uh, to have uh, 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 personnel like Professor Garrett Banks come in here and deliver uh, important lecture uh, for the general public and especially we are united from um, uh, Australian High Commission and also Sri Lankan Economic Association as well as Central Bankers, General Public. I think uh, uh, we will have a very interesting and very useful uh, 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 talk by, by an eminent resource person uh, who is well known uh, all around the world. Let me uh, formally uh, introduce uh, the Professor Gary Banks. Uh, Professor uh, led Australia's Productivity Commission from 1998 to 2013, and in that period greatly expanded the Commission's role and influence. Professor Banks uh, also many key economic reforms in Australia and has presided on public inquiries in a range of policy areas such as infrastructure, industry assistance, health, carbon abatement and executive remuneration. He also chaired the Council of Australian Governments Review of Government Services and had responsibility for the Office of Regulation, Re Regulation Review. Among other activities, he was a member of the 1997 West Review of Higher Education and in 2005 to 2006, headed the Prime Minister's Regulation Task Force. In 2013 to 14, he was a member of the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Council in Australia. Professor Bank, uh, Banks is currently a professional fellow at the Melbourne Institute of Economic and Social Research and chair of the OECD Regulatory Policy Committee, trained in economics at Monash University and the Australian National University. His early career was spent at general agreements on tariff and trade, GATT, now called World Trade Organization, in Geneva, and at the Trade Policy Research Centre, London. Professor Banks' contributions to public policy have been recognized through various awards, honors, including the Economic Society of Australia's inaugural Distinguished Public Policy Fellow Award in 2014 and Officer of the Order of Australia in 2007. I have a large uh, list of uh, his uh, publications, awards, previous roles, uh, and lectures, oration. I, I, I don't think I need to. Uh, all the details uh, is, is well known. Just to give you briefly a current position that is holding Professor Professor Fellow at Melbourne is University Institute for Applied Economics and Social Research, Chair of Regulatory Policy Committee OECD Paris, Independent non executive Director McCarr Group, Chairperson of Student Studies Advisory Council Melbourne, <coughs> Senior Fellow, Centre for Independent Studies Sydney, likewise there is large is a long list here. And today, Professor is going to uh, talk uh, on an important uh, uh, topic, especially that this is also uh, very timely and relevant for, for, for us in Sri Lanka, that we are trying to institutionalize a lot of reforms. So here, uh, Professor is going to talk about institutions to support reform. Uh, and Australian perspective, I think uh, we would be very lucky to hear, uh, listen to his his uh, knowledge, uh, expertise, and share experience in Australia. Thank you very much. What do you think? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Governor, uh, Governor, uh, other dignitaries, and, and uh, uh, friends of Australia. Um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, back in Colombo. And when I say that, I have to say that the last time I was here was in 1980. And I came here with my wife and my children because Colombo was a stopover point on the Swiss air flight between Sydney and Zurich. And so we had three or four days. We stayed at the Mount Lavinia Hotel and we had a lovely time. And my wife and I said, we must come back to Sri Lanka. So uh, half of us have come back. So I'm back. Uh, and I said, next time I come back, I'd like to stay at that other nice hotel, the Goldface Hotel. And that's where I'm staying. Thank you to the High Commission, High Commissioner. 
for putting me up there. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And of course, uh, Australia and Sri Lanka have many, many uh, uh, links between our two countries and our two people. And I live at the moment on the Melbourne University precinct and there are many students at university uh, from Sri Lanka there. And um, uh, so it's a great pleasure uh, altogether all uh, to be here. Well, uh, one of the things that we have in common, of course, is uh, the challenge of reform. And when I was here last in 1980, uh, if I recall right, um, uh, Sri Lanka was going through a period of reform, including trade liberalisation, and I met a colleague from the World Bank at the Mount Lavinia Hotel, uh, and he was here calculating effective rates of assistance uh, as part of a, a tariff reform uh, regime uh, that was going on at, at that time. And of course, uh, now uh, Sri Lanka is going through another process of renewal of, of reform and, of course, confronting uh, all the challenges that all countries face uh, in a reform process. So my first message to you uh, is that this is not a new problem. And uh, this is something that goes back a long way. So we have Niccolo Machiavelli in his famous work, The Prince from the 16th century, saying there's nothing more difficult to carry out than to initiate a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies in all those who profit by the old order and only lukewarm defenders uh, in those who would profit by the new. Well, I think Machiavelli in the 16th century essentially summed up the problem we all face. Huh? And, uh, and those of us who've done academic work know that there's been a lot of academic work in this area, but essentially the problem is encapsulated uh, in Machiavelli's uh, The Prince. But uh, when we look at what is behind Machiavelli's uh, principle about the challenges of reform, there are a number of things that I'm sure all countries face, even though obviously we have different institutions, we have different histories and cultures. But reform inevitably, particularly structural reform, uh, involves some losers as well as winners. And of course, the, the costs of reform tend to be more concentrated on particular groups uh, within the community who have a much stronger incentive to protest uh, than some of the gainers who are, who are more widely dispersed, they're typically consumers, uh, average people who also don't really appreciate how much is at stake for them. And typically the other problem in a political economy sense is that the costs often come early and the benefits take a little time uh, to be realised. So as a result, uh, those who are against reform, as Machiavelli pointed out all that time ago, tend to be better informed and uh, more uh, have a stronger voice against reform than those who will potentially benefit. And I'm sure in your country, as in mine, we have seen examples where those who are opposed to reform have successfully been able to block reform, even though that reform would have been uh, advantageous and beneficial uh, to the community uh, as a whole. One of the challenges in reform, however, is that the government's own administrative structures can compound the difficulties of reforms. In my country, and I'm sure in yours, we have uh, fragmented government administrations uh, with different parts of the administration focused on different parts of the community, different parts of the economy. Uh, and this can make it difficult to get a sense of what's at stake for the economy as a whole. A lot of the advice that's coming through the bureaucracy tends to be rather partial advice rather than advice that has a strong sense of what the national benefits would be uh, relative uh, to the costs. Well, uh, hearing the stories uh, over the last two days uh, here in Sri Lanka, um, I had a sense of deja vu. It took me back to some extent to Australia in the 70s and 80s uh, and in the period when I was living in Geneva and coming home and having a stopover in Colombo with my family, that the issues that you're confronting in terms of the need to reform were also issues that we faced uh, in Australia. We had very high industry protection, 
with tariffs that were made to measure to protect individ individual industries according to their lack of competitiveness. So in a sense, the more uncompetitive they were, the more they were rewarded with high protection, which of course imposed a massive cost on the consumer. Behind the border, we had extensive barriers to competition in regulatory, uh, regulatory barriers uh, in, in the services sector. You name a service and it will have been hidebound by regulation in Australia in that period. We had government monopolies in infrastructure and public utility services, uh, which whatever their other virtues, uh, uh, efficiency was not one of them. These were high cost services, uh, often delivering uh, uh, important inputs to industry, which made industry uncompetitive. And we had a labour market in which uh, many of the rules that applied within enterprises throughout the country, whether it was in the city or way out in the regional areas, were centrally prescribed and a very rigid uh, industrial relations system occurred at that time. Well, unsurprisingly, uh, that produced an uncompetitive economy, an economy in which we had highly fragmented, uh, low-scale industry, high cost uh, uh, public utility services, weak export performance, uh, reliant on just a few key commodities where we had such a strong comparative advantage that a lot of these other problems were not such a problem. And of course, low productivity. This chart here shows how Australia uh, lagged uh, OECD countries, most OECD countries in terms of productivity growth uh, at that time. Now there's a famous saying from Paul Krugman from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He said, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's nearly everything. So what did he mean by that? He meant that productivity is a major source of uh, income growth and uh, income growth uh, ultimately buys lots of things, including uh, uh, social services, uh, uh, payments to people who are uh, disadvantaged uh, and so on. So growth really has its origins uh, and growth in income and per capita income largely has its origins in, in productivity growth. Well, um, the story uh, in this chart here was reflected in a significant decline in Australia's uh, uh, GDP, per capita GDP ranking in the OECD area. In 1900, Australia was the wealthiest country in the world in terms of per capita income. We had very abundant natural resources, we had very few people, we had very high terms of trade and we did very well. By 1950, we were still very high, we were still around fourth in the OECD area in terms of per capita GDP. But ultimately, the, the, uh, the productivity problems that I'm talking about and the, and the inefficiency of the economy detracted from our uh, growth performance so that uh, by, uh, um, uh, by 1982 uh, or 83, Australia had declined to 14th uh, in the OECD area. Now, a lot of people started to be concerned about that because our slippage in the OECD area almost meant, also meant that the relative in, uh, living standards of Australians compared to people that we were accustomed to comparing ourselves with within the OECD area, our living standards were slipping. So a lot of attention started to be brought to the question of how can Australia improve its productivity performance? And we came up with uh, uh, a framework that's described on this slide here. Productivity begins within enterprises that are producing things. That's where the source of the country's wealth ultimately comes. And enterprises need the incentives to be productive. The most important incentive of all is competition. But there are also disincentives which come from regulation and which come from budgetary assistance that cushions 
uh, firms from the realities of, of the market. So a reason to be more productive, incentives is a, is a key driver of productivity. But firms also need the ability to be more productive. And the two dimensions of ability to be more productive are human capital, the capabilities of their workforce, the skills, but also the infrastructure services that are available to firms, transport, communications, energy. But they also need the flexibility. So they could have the pressure to be, they could have competitive pressure, they could have uh, a very highly skilled workforce, but if they're tied up in red tape, if they can't make managerial decisions because of strict labour market regulation, etc., or environmental regulation, or regulations about uh, uh, where developments can occur, etc., uh, then there's going to be a problem. So ideally, um, a government needs to think about incentives, capabilities, and flexibility when it's thinking about enhancing the productivity uh, of its economy through the productivity uh, of its of its enterprises. So in the, what we call the reform era in Australia, which went from the, uh, the mid 80s uh, through to about 2005, it was a 20 year period of reforms. Um, we, we undertook a, a range of reforms that addressed, uh, that addressed those, those three categories that I talked about, the drivers and the enablers of, of productivity. Trade liberalisation occurred from the early 1980s. We then uh, liberalised our capital markets, and I'll come back and talk a bit more about that. From the late 1980s, we uh, introduced a number of pro-competitive reforms to public utilities and public enterprises. We started to deregulate the labour market in the late 1980s, I should say, under a Labour government uh, at the time. And uh, then there was a range of reforms to uh, human services administration, uh, health, education, public administration, and a national competition policy, uh, which commenced in the mid-1990s uh, and was, was uh, transformed and extended into a national reform agenda that moved away from competition per se to look at issues of education and health uh, and a range of other things that matter to enhancing the well-being of, of the community. Well, import barriers in Australia now are very low. Uh, this is net assistance. I think it's an effective rate concept that looks at um, uh, uh, both the assistance on outputs and also the assistance or taxes on inputs. And you can see there that there's been a very dramatic increase uh, in, in, in protection or assistance of Australian industry, both manufacturing and agriculture uh, throughout that period. That translated almost directly into increased trade intensity. Now, trade intensity, as it's measured here, is trade, which is exports plus imports relative to GDP. We, we saw not only our imports increase, which you'd expect if you reduce import protection, but we also saw exports increase just as dramatically. So over this period, if, you, if I had another chart there that showed exports separately to imports, you'd see that they were both going up uh, in the same, uh, with the same trajectory. And of course, economists here know that uh, a tax on imports ends up being a tax on exports. If you remove a tax on imports, you're freeing up uh, exports and making your export uh, sector more, more competitive. We had a surge in productivity growth um, uh, through that period of the 90s that followed the reforms that occurred in the 80s and, and early 90s. Uh, my organisation looked at some of the other possible explanations for that uh, and concluded that the reforms were the main contribution to that, uh, to that rapid growth in multi-factor productivity in the period uh, through the 90s. And when we looked at what had happened with R&D and innovation, we also saw there was a dramatic increase through that period, uh, which was in large part driven by more competitive pressure uh, on firms to be able to produce lower cost and, and more, more uh, attractive uh, goods, uh, goods and services. Interestingly enough, um, unemployment through the reform era fell along with protection levels. So in Australia, everybody said, if we reduce 
tariffs, if we reduce uh, uh, protection, we will see unemployment go up. And certainly unemployment did go up in some industries, but, uh, but jobs were created in other industries. And when we looked at the net effect overall in Australia, uh, we found that uh, the unemployment rate uh, actually declined. So the green line at the top uh, shows what's happened to unemployment uh, in, in Australia through that period. We also, through that period, I could have drawn another line, which was labour force participation. So not only did unemployment decline, but labour force participation went up. So it was a very successful labour market story, which went against what most people were arguing would be the case uh, if, if Australia uh, liberalised its, uh, its trade. And we saw with the surge in labour productivity that real wage growth increased. There was a 40% increase in the average real wage of the average worker uh, in Australia, uh, which was the most dramatic improvement in, in, um, in living standards in Australia, uh, certainly in the post-war period. The interesting thing is that those gains in living standards were distributed across uh, across the income spectrum. So as you can see on that chart, while the highest income uh, cohort seemed to do best in terms of the percentage improvement in their income, all, uh, all quintiles of the income distribution had their, uh, had their living standards increased as a result of the reforms. And finally, uh, our economic ranking uh, was restored. So our international uh, ranking in terms of per capita GDP came back. Now, if I did a uh, early on when Australia was the number one country in the world for per capita income, the other number, the other countries that were in the top five were countries like Argentina, uh, Venezuela, Uruguay, a number of Latin American countries that had a similar uh, economic structure to Australia. Um, but if I drew a chart for those countries, we'd see the line continuing to go down. Australia was the only country that turned its performance around, uh, which it did through the reforms of the, of the 80s and, and early 90s. Well, how did we do that? How did we achieve reform? How did we defy Machiavelli uh, and achieve reform in a situation in which reform has a lot of uh, uh, obstacles to get over? Well, we did something that was sort of unusual and the World Bank didn't recommend this. We started our reform program at the border. We reduced trade barriers first before we did anything else, before we did any other reforms behind the border, including labour market reforms. And what happened was uh, uh, that those, uh, uh, those reductions in import protection uh, put extra pressure on, on industries who in turn demanded that government if it was going to reduce their, in, their protection on their outputs, also uh, became more efficient in producing infrastructure inputs like uh, the public utilities, energy, electricity, etc. Unlike a lot of countries, Australia did not liberalise its tariffs in the context of trade negotiations. Um, even though there's an old joke in Australia that we were always a GATT-fearing nation in the days when the World Trade Organization was referred to as the GATT. In, in fact, most of our own liberalization was done unilaterally. And the reason for that was that our main export interest at that time was agriculture. And those of you who know about World Trade know that agriculture was, has always been uh, a poor relation of the, of the World Trade Organization and the GATT. So we went ahead and did it unilaterally for the domestic gains uh, uh, that we get from that. Uh, and what we know from a lot of modelling is the biggest gains you get from trade liberalisation uh, are from your reducing your own barriers to trade. They're the ones that, that actually in the end are, are more costly than, than other countries' barriers to your exports. However, uh, reforms didn't happen overnight with the exception of an early experiment that failed miserably. We learned that it was better to be somewhat slower but also more certain and to do things in a predictable way that the public could, could understand. So the reforms were generally implemented gradually, whether they were uh, in regulatory areas or whether they were in, in border, uh, border protection. Uh, 
but ultimately the reforms occurred across uh, quite, a broad, uh, quite a broad front. And importantly, uh, we assisted adjustment in sensitive sectors uh, and regions. And we did that generally on the basis of adjustment programs that were fairly general rather than ones being targeted at specific firms or industries but uh, we had a range of adjustment programs that involved retraining or regional uh, regional support that could be that could benefit a number of firms rather than just choosing particular firms to provide uh, that kind of assistance so in a sense uh, they were strategies that we followed but um, I don't think that were the real reason why our reform program actually um, uh, was successful and was not reversed. There were some deeper preconditions for success. And, and, and this, reflecting on the Machiavelli point, uh, it's very important that Australia found that making a case for reform that the public could understand and that those who were bearing the costs of uh, existing policy could appreciate and see that there would be benefits from them. That was a very important part of the Australian approach uh, to reform. And secondly, the communication process of explaining to the public why reform was needed and why particular reforms would be beneficial to the Australian public was also an important part of what we did. Research, public consultation, uh, but also, importantly, leadership, both within public administration, but ultimately political leadership, were all critical in a communication uh, program that, uh, that convinced uh, many people, including the media, who's the toughest, the toughest group to convince, that reform would be beneficial uh, to Australians in the longer term. Underpinning uh, both of those things in Australia were some institutional innovations and I'm going to talk about one that I was most closely associated with myself um, but I'll come to some others uh, uh, that have occurred and I know that these are issues that are being discussed uh, in Sri Lanka as well. I made the point much earlier that one of the compounding factors in the difficulties of reform is the fragmentation that occurs within public administrations where you have different parts of the government effectively sponsoring different parts of the community or different parts of the economy, making it hard uh, to get a, um, a coherent national program uh, of reform. So what Australia uh, did with some reforms that go right back to the 1970s is intentionally develop an institution that would support government in its reform efforts um, that institution was called the Productivity, uh, was called the Productivity Commission, which, as I indicated on that slide, was interesting in that it was an independent body, but it was a, it was within government, and its job was to conduct public inquiries and reviews of policies and regulation, and to advise governments uh, at their request on reforms that would be in the long-term uh, national interest. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about about this organisation, um, hopefully not too long, and if you have further questions, I'll be happy to respond. Um, it's an institution that actually uh, goes back a long way and involved an earlier institution. I think you had something equivalent. You had a tariff commission, we had a tariff board, um, which was an independent statutory body, uh, quite transparent in its processes. That was transformed into an organisation that took a much broader view uh, about uh, uh, policy and what policy should be achieving uh, than simply looking at tariffs that would, would make industries happy. Uh -huh. So the goal became uh, an approach to public policy that would enhance the well-being of the, of the community as a whole. It was designed initially as a counterweight to influence the influence that vested interests were having on trade policy. Up until that time, those who were pro-protection uh, had the ear of government and were convincing the public that protection was in their interests. The government created an institution to tell the other side of the story and to give a voice to consumers and taxpayers who had no such uh, uh, presence in the, in, the, in, the, in the policy debate. It had a number of design principles uh, uh, behind it, um, 
The first of these related to independence. So although it was a statutory body, although it was a government body, it, its independence was formalised by statute. Commissioners were appointed for five year periods. They couldn't be given the sack just for saying things that the government did not like. I found that very helpful at times. Huh? Um, the research staff were tenured public service officials. It received funding, block funding from the government, so it, it, it's, uh, it, it was able to use its resources as it saw fit. Um, and it operated within the Treasury portfolio, but at arm's length from the executive. It's an advisory body. It has no uh, executive power or, or regulatory uh, role. It, its job is to provide uh, advice to government which government will uh, accept or not, depending on the, how persuasive its case is. So the organisation has been seen as impartial and objective. And this chart shows where it operates within the Australian bureaucracy. So although it's independent, it, it, it reports through the Treasurer, but also it has a public reporting role. The second design principle is the transparency. Everything the Commission does is in the public domain. The whole purpose of the organisation was to bring about a broader public uh, awareness of the costs of the status quo and broader public support for poor government's reform uh, efforts. Um, so it, it conducted public uh, hearings, uh, uh, would put out draft reports, would, the public would have the opportunity to have a say uh, all the way along the line. So it meant that the institution was trusted as an institution that was not only independent, but was inclusive in the way it approached the policy advice it was giving to government. There was no covert influence and it was promoting a public debate and public understanding. The third principle, design principle, was an economy-wide approach. The old tariff board had been very focused on what particular industries needed to survive against imports. The new organisation was much more about what policies would be in the best interest of the community as a whole, not just the interest of the textiles industry, for example. And uh, in looking at issues, it also looked at the social and environmental dimension. So it wasn't just focused on the, on the pure economic efficiency side, but also would look at the questions of, of transition and adjustment and distribution. So it was an organisation that everybody accepted uh, was giving primacy to the national interest over uh, sectional uh, interests. Uh, most of the Commission's work, uh, which includes recommendations to government, particularly in sensitive areas, involves a public inquiry. And as I said, these inquiries were very transparent. They usually began with a reference from the government. So the Commission was not at liberty just to do whatever it liked, but it would only do uh, what the government asked it to do. But as I say, the government could tell it what to do, but it couldn't tell it what to say. And what it, its conclusion about what to say was based on its own research, but also a process that I've indicated there on the slide that was a very uh, interactive process with the community and with the industry uh, in which there was a call for submissions, there were initial consultations, an issues paper was put out, uh, a draft report was prepared, and there was an opportunity for everyone to comment uh, on that. Now, as you can imagine, you couldn't do that in two weeks. So the work that the Commission did was usually uh, in areas where it was very important, uh, the potential gains were so large that it was worth devoting serious effort to these issues. So a typical inquiry that the Commission would look at, let's call it, say, the, the assistance to the automotive industry in Australia, which was highly protected, an inquiry of that kind could take 12 months. Finally, recommendations would be made to the government, which would be, uh, find their way into a cabinet submission uh, through the relevant minister, uh, and then a decision and implementation. Well, how did the Commission help uh, with, this, uh, with this process? And um, uh, the points I make, I think, are points that would be generally accepted in Australia. So I'm not just coming over here to tell you a story that would not be uh, seen as true in Australia. In one way, it helped because it became clear to the government that the advice that the Productivity Commission was giving to it uh, 
was impartial advice and it was motivated by the national interest. So in Australia, there would be people who disagree with that advice, but no one would think that it was advice that was compromised by vested interests uh, or, uh, or a selective view of, of, uh, of who should be preferred in public policy. It was advice that the Commission, based on the processes that I just showed you, it considered to be in the national interest. So that's good because governments get lots of advice, right? But it's nice to have at least one source of advice that's motivated by the national interest. And if Sri Lanka is anything like Australia, a lot of the advice that governments get, particularly behind closed doors, is advice that's in the private interest, not in the public interest. So the Commission's advice was not like that. It helped by having evidence-based findings that had been publicly scrutinised. So the recommendations that came to the government, the government knew that these had been tested that they'd been uh, based on, on strong research, um, uh, including uh, uh, state-of-the-art modelling, general equilibrium modelling, etc., and that had been tested. Not only had there been good research, but in a draft report it had been exposed to public scrutiny from academics, from technical experts, but also from industry and consumer groups uh, and so on. And it provided ammunition to the government in selling reform. It's a lot easier to sell a reform if you can say to the public, this reform will raise our country's GDP by 2%, by $8 billion, for example. Not only that, uh, newspapers love to have numbers like that. So it means that the government's message is more likely to get out if it's got a big number attached to it. Um, but of course, the number has to be a credible number. And, th and therefore having tested it uh, was important. I'll give you an example here. This is a, a poster from the 1970s uh, of Australia's leading, one of Australia, well, at that time, Australia's only national newspaper, apart from the, the Financial Review of Business newspaper. And that was a billboard that was outside every news agency in the country. And everybody who walked past saw this big sign, tariffs cost us, $2.7 uh, billion dollars a year. There's an old American joke that a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there, and pretty soon you're talking big money. Now, um, it's not so funny anymore. A billion dollars doesn't seem as much as it used to be before the global financial crisis. Huh? So this was the way uh, the Commission uh, helped inform the debate through the media by providing arguments, evidence, information and numbers uh, for those who, who were pushing a case for reform and wanting to demonstrate to the public uh, that there were, there were benefits overall, not just the costs that they would hear sometimes. So a fourth way in which the Commission helped the government in its reform agenda was it provided an opportunity for the government um, uh, to see uh, how the public would react to different reform ideas, right? It's quite a useful thing for a government to have at arm's length a body that's canvassing policy ideas, but at, at arm's length so that the government is not implicated in these proposals. It can watch how different ideas play out in the public domain. Uh, and see which ideas are likely to, to be uh, ones that would get support uh, in an actual policy. So it's like a trial run for a policy, whereas, as we know, quite often governments will introduce a policy and it'll, it'll turn out very badly and they'll have to retreat. Uh, this kind of process enables uh, policy ideas to be tested and for government to, uh, to observe that and there's a degree of, of political learning. The fifth way uh, is that the Commission's process helped build community awareness of the costs of existing policies and the benefits of reform. So a lot of people in Australia had only heard about the costs. Suddenly they were hearing about the benefits and they were also hearing that the capita incomes could increase uh, by several thousand dollars under a reform program. Uh, and, and, and so that they created a more neutral politics in which government knew that it had some support, including within the media, uh, as well as those who were opposed uh, to reform. This is a list um, 
uh, of some of the recent inquiry topics. Uh, some of these will be relevant to Sri Lanka, uh, some not. But you can see that all of them are quite important areas of public policy where there are potentially winners and losers from reform, uh, but also there's quite a lot at stake for the national economy in getting the answers right to these policy issues. So these are all ones that the Commission's looked at in the last uh, three or four or five, or five years, and typically it would have uh, three or four of these projects on uh, at any one time, going through the, the process that I described in that, in that earlier slide. Now, I have to confess at this point that the Productivity Commission was only one institution that supported the government and helped the government in its reform endeavours, and there were other uh, institutional ingredients that were quite important. Coordination and oversight mechanisms within and across governments, Australia is a federation with multiple governments, uh, were very, very important. Um, it's one thing to have a good policy idea, it's another to get it implemented. Coordination uh, uh, is a critical part of that uh, within, within the public sector. So at the political level, at the Commonwealth level, at the national government, we had a, a special committee of cabinet which brought the key economic ministers together. Uh, you have a lot more ministers than we have in Australia. Uh, we, we also have quite a lot, but only a few of them were able to come together to form this committee of cabinet to focus on, on the reform issues, which meant that they were all broadly discussing and debating and ultimately agreeing on a reform program. If you don't get the key ministers agreeing about reform, uh, it's gonna be very hard to implement it. Uh, we had a National Competition Council, which relates very much to our federal system, that was monitoring reforms, ensuring that what was promised was actually delivered. As we know, a lot gets promised, a lot gets, a lot gets announced, not so much gets implemented. So we had a, 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 a public process, a transparent process of monitoring uh, whether governments were delivering on the reforms that they'd promised. And this was again an independent body that would publish that information. Sometimes that information could be a little bit embarrassing to the government. But sometimes the knowledge that it would be published was a quite a good discipline on government actually following through on its reforms. And finally, uh, we have an Office of Best Practice Regulation. I've talked about this a little bit today, which would vet any new regulatory proposals um, uh, which were required to, to prepare a regulation impact statement. And, and regulatory proposals going to Cabinet had to be accompanied by information, uh, a regulation impact statement type information that had passed through this, this office. So it was a way of slowing down knee-jerk regulatory uh, responses and ensuring that regulations that were being introduced, the, the Cabinet, when it was looking at those, um, had the benefit of understanding what the pros and cons would be to avoid unintended consequences. I don't know about Sri Lanka, but Australia has a history of regulations that have unintended consequences. And sometimes those unintended consequences can be political as well as economic. So I think governments have seen that there's an advantage in, in having their eyes open uh, before uh, uh, implementing regulation. There's also been a number of quite influential uh, uh, task forces, review task forces and so on. Um, it was mentioned that I, I headed one task force for the Prime Minister on, on regulation. Uh, th these were often developed where there was a specific, a specific issue where a particular kind of review was needed that uh, was considered to be not something that the Productivity Commission could do at the time or wasn't as suited to. And of course, as in Sri Lanka, we have a number of think tanks and they also often were doing supportive work that got drawn and picked up by, by other bodies. But I'd have to say uh, that political and bureaucratic leadership were both very, very important. Um, all of those, important both in terms of establishing those institutions, but also using them in a way that was, uh, that was effective. Um, well, I've got the end of my story. I suppose the question is, uh, is any of this at all of any relevance to Sri Lanka? I'll leave you to judge that. Huh? But what, what we know is that each country is different. We each have our own history. We have our own cultures and institutions. But Machiavelli in Italy 
uh, in his book, The Prince, from the mid 16th century, uh, I think told us that all countries face the same fundamental challenges of reform, regardless of their, of their institutional or cultural or historical uh, circumstances. We in Australia have benefited from creating some institutions to identify reform needs and to build public support. And, and that has worked quite well for us. The kind of institutions that we created aren't necessarily institutions that would work in other countries. But what we've seen in the last decade is a number of other countries also creating uh, bodies rather similar to the Australian Productivity Commission uh, to do a similar job. And the first to do that was New Zealand, but that's cheating because New Zealand is like our little cousin. So they'd been watching us across the Tasman for some time and they ended up creating a mini version of a mini me, you know, a mini version of, of the Productivity Commission. But we've also seen uh, in Scandinavia, in Denmark and, and in uh, Sweden and Norway, uh, similar bodies being created for a, a finite period of time, established for three years to do a, a thorough review. Uh, in Latin America, both Chile and Mexico have established ongoing bodies. Uh, in Chile, in Mexico, they've now, uh, in Chile, I mean, they've now uh, uh, given it statutory, um, statutory backing. And the late breaking news is that in the European Union, a directive has emerged from Brussels requiring uh, those members of the currency bloc uh, to establish um, uh, what they're calling productivity boards, which have a similar role in terms of um, identifying reform needs and, and involved in, in, in public education about the benefits as well as the, the costs of reform. So um, I think some of that's relevant to Sri Lanka, but obviously you will have your own discussions, your own deliberations and your own considerations. And um, uh, it's been a great pleasure to have been able to come here and hear and learn from you as well as to say a few things about uh, what has happened in Australia. So thank you for that. I, I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you.